If I ever write this letter All the pages I could write But I don't know where to send it You have vanished heaven Knows where you live Heaven only knows If I ever write this letter In the words it would contain Just a non-requited lover Wishing she had never spoken the name Never In Unit 8, we have been talking about thermal stress. Um, when we talk about thermal stress, we're talking about hot work conditions or cold work conditions. Uh, so far, the first video, I introduced the uh, subject of thermal stress. We started talking about heat-related illness. In the second video, we talked about measures for preventing heat-related illness. In this last video, I want to talk about disorders associated with cold conditions in the workplace. Um, I would argue that heat in the workplace is a greater danger to workers, but there are disorders that can develop uh, that are associated with cold in the workplace. It can also be dangerous, it can be life-threatening, but the data, the data indicates uh, the fatality data, the injury data, indicate that heat is a greater concern in the workplace. But we can't ignore uh, cold in the workplace also. Uh, the workers that are going to have the greatest exposure to cold in the workplace, outdoor workers, workers who may be working in artificially cooled indoor environments, uh, a server room, a computer, uh, an IT person who works in the server room. They keep server rooms really cold uh, to protect the computer systems. Also indoor um, or walk-in refrigerator freezer systems. That, uh, warehouses that are basically big freezers or refrigerators. Workers in those environments would also be susceptible, and that's what we have going on in this picture here. You notice, you know, this looks like a Lowe's or a Home Depot where these guys are working, but this is a huge refrigerator, um, a huge freezer, perhaps, and they are dressed accordingly. They have uh, snowmobile suits. They have uh, coverings for their head and their face to protect themselves, along with gloves, which would be needed in this environment. Now this, this may be a zero degree Fahrenheit environment if it's a freezer warehouse. Um, and the disorders associated with cold could develop in this environment. You know, frostbite, hypothermia, and so on. Uh, and cold storage computer centers are examples of artificial environments. Also, if you work in an industry where workers have to handle dangerously cold materials like liquid nitrogen. Um, there would be some measures that would need to be taken also to protect those workers from those uh, extremely cold, dangerously cold materials. 
uh, liquid nitrogen, for example, 330 degrees below Fahrenheit. 330, degree, 330 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And we have tankers on the roads daily across the United States carrying liquid nitrogen at these temperatures. Yeah, this does pose a potential exposure hazard for a lot of different types of workers, the drivers. Uh, if there's an accident, there could, be, uh, there could be exposure for other people on the roadway or first responders who have to work the accident. Um, 330 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, you got to have some precautions in place. With this level of cold, you're talking about contact frostbite, instantaneous frozen flesh. Because that's what frostbite is. We hear a lot about it, we watch documentaries about it, but frostbite is literally when our, fresh, our flesh freezes. And it can result in amputations, it can result in death, it can result in infection. Uh, again, frozen flesh, extremities, the, the nose, the fingers, the toes are going to be affected first. Uh, prognosis can be good for recovery. It's treatable and full recovery is possible with early detection and treatment. But if it's not detected early enough, gangrene can set in. Uh, with dry gangrene, there's two varieties. No blood flow, the flesh dies. With wet gangrene, uh, we have a bacterial infection that sets in. Uh, this can result in body parts being lost. Um, symptoms of frostbite, a grayish skin tone, uh, pain, sometimes the victim may be unaware of the freezing, but they'll feel a tingling. Uh, they'll feel uh, pain sensations in those extremities that are being affected. If someone is developing frostbite, treatment would include slow warming of affected body parts. Medical treatment may be necessary in more severe cases. And I mentioned contact frostbite. This is when uh, the flesh is instantaneously frozen with contact when coming into contact with cold materials. Again, this is going to be relatively rare, uh, but it can occur, this instantaneous frostbite. Normally, it's going to occur over an ex extended exposure period, but it can occur instantaneously when there, there is contact with liquid nitrogen or other extremely cold materials. Um, in my experience, I've never had to deal with a case of frostbite. It, it does occur, of course, it, in, in some industries, uh, some safety professionals will perhaps have to deal with, with frostbite cases. Uh, even working in Colorado, um, where you know, we worked in some cold conditions, but uh, workers were well protected. Uh, they were able to get in out of the cold periodically as needed to warm up and we never did have a case of frostbite. Uh, but one thing about my industry though, when it is extremely cold, let's say it's below zero or even below 10 degrees, a lot of the construction activity will, will just shut down during those extreme cold periods. Uh, if, if the project is shut down because of the cold, because of icy conditions, well, that's, uh, there's no exposure going to occur. It's those times when you have to keep working through the cold when exposure could occur, when frostbite could occur. Uh, not the, the most fun to look at, but here are some examples of uh, frostbitten toes. The person's probably going to lose their toes. Then we have frostbitten cheeks on this gentleman here. We mentioned the uh, grayish coloration to the skin. It's going to start out with first degree frostbite as more of a, a reddish coloration. And then as it progresses, our, as our flesh becomes frozen, it's going to turn more gray. Again, we have first degree, second degree, third degree frostbite uh, illustrated in these three diagrams. Uh, for us to learn a little bit more about frostbite, I'd like for us to take a, a look at this quick video. Uh, go ahead and get it started. Growing up in Michigan, it's cold. No, 
Really, it's frickin' cold. As a kid, my mom was always worried about frostbite. But what is it, and why is Jack Frost so nibbly? Hello, my frosty friends. Trace here for DNews. Frostbite is a medical condition where your skin and underlying tissue can literally start to freeze, a bit like a human popsicle. Being exposed to extremely cold temperatures combined with fast winds, like those on Mount Everest, can see frostbite set in within just five minutes. So what is frostbite really like? Well, we were fortunate enough to talk to a former Everest expedition leader, Bob Hoffman, about his experience with frostbite. I had a couple of close calls on Everest. It's, uh, it's one of those mountains, no matter how experienced you are, uh, something can always go wrong. Everest Summit is located at an elevation of almost 29,000 feet. Now, at that altitude, a climber's body has a lot to contend with, which may be why it's often referred to as the death zone. Average temperatures here fluctuate between negative 31 Fahrenheit in winter to a pleasant negative four in summer, and wind speeds during the May climbing season are usually over 100 miles an hour. In fact, the highest wind speed on Everest was 175 miles an hour, recorded in February 2004. On my last climb in 2003, uh, I was on the summit and we had some lousy weather. Uh, it was uh, extremely windy and, and very cold. The ice was just blowing off and, and you felt you like you were being sandblasted. Normally, our core temperature is a cozy 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature is actually crucial for maintaining the critical body functions that keep us alive. But strong winds and frigid temperatures can make staying warm a constant challenge, which is why if our core temperature starts to dip for any reason, the hypothalamus, that's the thermoregulatory center of our brain, springs into survival mode in order to protect our vital organs and maintain that core temperature. See, our blood carries oxygen molecules for energy, but also distributes warmth to every part of our body. If your core temperature is compromised, your blood vessels will constrict and divert that warmth away from the extremities and toward the vital organs. Basically, you can live without an arm, but not without lungs or your intestines, and your body knows it. Once the hypothalamus diverts the warmth to protect your inner organs, your extremities are then vulnerable to frostbite. Frostbite progresses in three stages. The first stage, called frostnip, is where the surface of the skin freezes. During the second stage, called superficial frostbite, the tissue beneath the skin starts to freeze. And by the third stage, known as deep frostbite, your muscles, tendons, nerves, and blood vessels start to freeze. It's at this point that your skin may start to turn dark blue or black, indicating that the tissue is dead, and you're probably going to lose some fingers and toes. This is all pretty scary stuff. With the right gear, you can endure cold weather for a time without suffering from frostbite or hypothermia. However, as Bob found out, you can't always rely on it. The Sherpa that I was climbing with, Pembo, motioned to me that my oxygen mask was icing up where you exhale. And as I tried to clear it, I broke the oxygen tube going into the mask. Climbers also have to cope with limited oxygen in the air, which is why they always carry their own oxygen supply. When the body is starved of oxygen, that's called hypoxia. Hypoxia triggers altitude sickness, leading climbers with a shortness of breath, elevated heart rates, and feelings of confusion. And for some reason, if a climber does find themselves without oxygen, the severity of frostbite can dramatically increase. When I stood up to start going down, my legs just collapsed out from underneath me. I didn't have the strength to stand up. Altogether, it's a perfect storm of awful. Bob was experiencing something called high altitude frostbite, a deadly combination of frostbite, dehydration, and hypoxia. Aware of these compounding dangers, Bob knew he had to reach base camp and find medical help as soon as possible. For the next 12 hours, I crawled, slid, and fell down the mountain. And I knew that if I stopped, I'd die where I stopped, but managed to get down to uh, a high camp. Uh, but uh, I paid the price with some pretty severe frostbite on my feet. Luckily, he lived to tell the tale, and although you may not find yourself in the same position as Bob anytime soon, it's worth remembering that you don't have to climb Everest to experience frost nip, frostbite, or hypothermia. So if you're planning a cold climate adventure, make sure you wrap up to keep warm. Climbing Mount Everest is not for the faint of heart, and seldom few have managed it without the help of a knowledgeable Sherpa guide on Everest. Don't forget to tune in to the premiere of Sherpa, airing Saturday, April 23rd at 9, 8 central, as part of the elevation. Again, most of us aren't going to be climbing Mount Everest or doing any kind of, uh, of uh, high-risk uh, climbing. We're not going to be working for companies where workers are going to be exposed to these environments more than likely. I guess there's always an outside chance, but but uh, 
it does t give us a little bit more information about frostbite and the dangers of frostbite. Now the temperatures that they mentioned, minus, minus thir 31 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, the, certainly those temperatures can be reached at you know, a lot of different locations in the U.S. But generally speaking, workers aren't going to be required to, to work in those environments. Uh, but if they do, uh, precautions need to be taken. And we'll talk about some, some methods of prevention before we're through with this, with this video. For me, probably the greater concern would be a disorder, disorder referred to as hypothermia or a dangerous lowering of the body's core temperature. Um, when we talk about a dangerous lowering, uh, what's considered, what is the threshold uh, of, of what would be dangerous levels of hypothermia, 95 degrees Fahrenheit or lower for a core body temperature is considered dangerous. Uh, you'll see that that value, that threshold show up in a lot of the literature that deals with hypothermia. Now the thing that's dangerous or tricky about hypothermia is that it doesn't have to be below freezing for it to occur. It can occur at temperatures above freezing. For example, if you have workers exposed to these conditions, 56 degrees Fahrenheit, it's wet, their clothes get wet, it's windy, and they are not wearing proper clothing for that environment, it is certainly possible and it does occur. Uh, it's possible for the development of hypothermia, for that lowering of the body temperature below normal, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but you know, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when it becomes, uh, it's considered at a high level of danger for the for the person but when it starts going below 98.6 as it could in these conditions then that is a reason for concern another example where hypothermia could occur at temperatures above freezing would be a worker who falls into water and is trapped in 70 degree fahrenheit water in 98.6 is our normal body temperature 70 degrees is 28.6 degrees lower. So if, if a worker's in the water, they can't get out, they're trapped for whatever reason in that water, they could certainly become hypothermic in that environment. So uh, with frostbite, the temperatures need to be below freezing and they really need to be pretty far below freezing for frostbite to occur. But with hypothermia, it can occur at higher temperatures. It can occur at relatively warm temperatures. Uh, some symptoms of hypothermia. Uncontrollable shivering. Shivering is one of the body's responses uh, to cold conditions. As we shiver, our muscles contract and, and our autonomic nervous system is causing that contraction in an effort to, to heat up, to, to warm, warm us up, to, to maintain our core body temperature where it needs to be. Uh, difficulty speaking is also a symptom of hypothermia, or it may be a, a it may uh, be a precursor to the development of hypothermia. Uh, shivering is early on. Once it gets to a certain point, the shivering may stop. That's uh, with the shivering stops. It's reached a level of severity that's certainly going to require medical care. A drowsiness. Uh, I just want to go to sleep. It's so cold. I just let, let me get some rest. Not a good sign. Uh, if treatment is required, and I would say if it gets beyond the shivering and the difficult difficulty in speaking, medical treatment would be required. We need to detect detect the condition early. We need to get the workers indoors and we need to consider medical professional treatment for uh, the affected workers. And again, it's, this could be workers who are t working in environments 20 degrees above freezing, if they're wet, if it's windy, if they're not wearing the proper clothing. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed about telling this story on myself, but it went to an OSU football game years ago. I think it was in October. And 
I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And it was stupid of me to only be wearing shorts and a t-shirt because the temperature, the forecast was in the 50s. And we ended up at the game. It rained a little bit. The wind was blowing. Uh, I, I was borderline hypothermic by the end of that football game because I wasn't properly dressed. The temperature was in the 50s. I was wet and it was windy. I uh, was way underdressed for that environment. I learned a, a valuable lesson there for me personally, but also about how we can develop, uh, we, how we can possibly become hypothermic, even if it's relatively warm outside, even if it's well above freezing temperatures. A couple of videos for us to look at. We got death by hypothermia and uh, emergency treatment for severe hypothermia. He uh, has a pneumothorax and his temperature is obviously uh, quite low. He, uh, he has an external warming blanket on him, a, uh, a bear hugger, a, the Arctic sun. So I, I do want to point that out. Augusta, Georgia is very, uh, is, a, is a warm climate. This is a gentleman, I'm guessing a homeless person who was found under a bridge in a Augusta, Georgia with a very warm climate. It, it wasn't necessarily an extreme cold spell. Um, you're exposed to, to the, uh, the elements without proper protection. Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, you could become hypothermic. Chest tube in here. So we're gonna, uh, his temperature apparently is dropping a little bit more than, uh, than actually improving. So we're gonna actually do a uh, we're going to lodge him with warm fluids through his chest tube. Put it in there and suck it back out. There's okay. We're going to try to eat it. Is it okay? All right, so it's already been cleansed. So we're just going to put this in and then we're going to run the fluids in. We're going to secure it. There you go. And that way we think it won't leak. Yeah. And then if we have to, we can I, just, in, in theory, you would use two chest tubes, one in and one out. We're trying to avoid right. that. So we're, we're going to okay. close. So we're actually going to clamp. No. So at this point, we're going to clamp, which you normally would not do on a chest tube. Uh-huh. And then we're going to run through it. So Rick, when, yeah. when you intubated this guy? Yeah. Okay. And does he have a central line in? He does not yet. Yeah. Okay. He's got a 16 to 18 to a 20 here. Okay. And you've, 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 seen, no, you've seen no cardiac irritability going on? We, I mean, he's been in the field. His heart rate's been up and down. It's been... Did, did, he have, did he have... He did not have Osborne, did not have Osborne waves. That's interesting. So he's hypothermic and he voted twice. What's your thoughts on using Ekwon? Well, you haven't suggested it. <laughs> no? Good, good. Because he, fit, he fits the criteria for it. Well, he does meet the criteria. His temperature is less than 32 degrees. He's hypotensive. He was hypotensive. Uh, his calcium, I mean, his potassium is not out. Um, but his temperature started, actually was going in the wrong direction, as opposed to you know, going back up, probably because of after drop. Um, so he, he does meet criteria for ECMO. The one question uh, which you know, CT surgery has you know, put their two cents in and they don't think he's a candidate is, you know, would he need anticoagulation? Um, okay. Because to be on ECMO, you would need... And he's got a pelvic fracture. And he's got a pelvic fracture. He's got a pelvic fracture. Oh, he so does. So that takes okay. him out. That. What's, What's your, your goal, goal on how, how, how much, how are you going to warm him up to? What, because of the cardiac arrest, does he deserve some period of 24 hours of hypothermia? Uh, um, and, and apparently, you know, the literature apparently says that there, there is some question on that. Some people recommend if there was cardiac arrest and they're still altered. That's a good question. I mean, he, he, had, you know, he had a cardiac arrest. He's not neurologically intact. Does he deserve some hypothermia? He's already have a, you know hypothermia. Yeah. You know, with the latest evidence that shows that really it may not be hypothermia that you need, but really just you know preventing. I'm gonna go ahead and stop that there. It's it's interesting, but it, I don't know that it really is applicable to what we'll be facing as safety professionals. If we have workers that get to that point, they. Uh, with the uncontrollable shivering, difficulty speaking, uh, we're going to take them to the medical professionals and let those medical professionals 
take care of the worker for us. Again, we're not doctors. We shouldn't pretend to be doctors uh, in our uh, safety practices. But hypothermia, we, we want to do what we can, train our workers the best we can uh, to prevent them being in conditions where they, they can go hypothermic, where they can have that uh, dangerously low core body temperature. Another possible concern related to cold, but it's not just cold, it's wet conditions also. Uh, this is a condition you may have heard of, trench foot, immersion foot. This is from pro prolonged exposure. Our skin has prolonged exposure to cold and wet conditions. Uh, hunters, outdoor workers, soldiers, hence the, the label trench foot, uh, are perhaps more susceptible, more likely to be exposed to develop this disorder. Uh, but it's again, it's the the cold the wet. It's a lack of ventilation and a lack of movement on the part of the affected person that will develop what we see here which It could result in infection. It could result in amputation if not detected and corrected and treated soon enough um, The classic example the, the, the example that maybe is the most applicable for a lot of workplace settings would be feet and work boots. Wet feet and work boots in cold environments and for extended periods of time. One of the things that I would always uh, preach to the guys I work with is always have extra socks, extra boots in case your feet get wet. You don't want to have to go through an entire shift wearing wet socks, wet boots. Now that's nothing that the company provided for them, but uh, I felt it was important for them to to have that you know extra equipment available if they did get wet, and not just boots and socks, but an entire you know, set of clothing. Because in my industry, we are working outdoors. We are working around water a lot. There's a pretty good chance that we're going to get wet at some point. So have, have an extra set of clothing, including boots and socks, that you can change into when that happens. Uh, and like I said, if the conditions leading to this disorder not corrected, there can be serious uh, physical consequences. Preventing cold, cold weather disorders, uh, like I said earlier, in many industries, it, once it gets to a certain point, uh, once it gets to a certain temperature, operations will shut down. Uh, if you are working through cold conditions, make sure your workers have proper clothing for those conditions. Make sure they understand that they need to cover exposed skin. Uh, Teach them the importance of staying dry. Again, having that extra set of clothing is something that I would include in training. Uh, have access to a heated enclosure for the workers. Have some place that workers can go to warm up if they, if they are getting overexposed to the cold conditions. You know, similar to what we talked about with uh, hot conditions, have a cooling station. Well, here you would want uh, a warming station. Uh, pay attention uh, to the potential for the development of different disorders and always have your eye on early detection. Try to, de to detect potential problems before they become serious problems. If you have workers handling cold materials like the liquid nitrogen or something similar to that, make sure they have the gloves and other personal protective equipment that will allow them to handle those materials. In training the workers, monitoring work operations, just like with heat, it's very important. And the monitoring, we do that as safety professionals, but it's the frontline supervisors that have the real responsibility for that monitoring. Excuse me. Uh, as when it comes to PPE, make sure the workers have uh, have the proper clothing to protect their head, their hands, and their feet. Uh, 
much of our heat is lost through these extremities. So gloves, some type of head covering, and good footwear is crucial. Now generally speaking, employers are not required to provide footwear for workers. But if a company is literally, or not literally, if they are regularly exposing their workers to extremely cold conditions, I think it would be uh, appropriate for them to consider providing appropriate footwear, you know, insulated boots, for example, for those workers. When it comes to clothing for the outdoor workers, uh, some, some, some ideas that you would want to share with your workers. Uh, dress in multiple layers. Uh, have insulated coveralls available. The construction industry, I think everybody has a set of insulated coveralls available. Um, head, neck, and face protection. Hand protection. Insulated boots. Uh, ideally, the insulated boots will have a breathable Gore-Tex liner. Uh, Gore-Tex is a material that's, that's waterproof, but it is breathable. Now, there are a lot of waterproof materials available. Uh, you know, nylon and rubber materials or synthetic rubber materials that are waterproof, but they're not breathable. Your feet will sweat inside of those, uh, of those materials. But with Gore-Tex, your feet aren't going to sweat. The water can't get in, but the water vapor from the sweat can get out. There is a, some degree of ventilation going on and good socks are important and again have extra everything is a good is a best practice if you have workers in cold wet conditions you also want to make sure your workers uh, don't overdress and the layering is important if they are wearing layers um, they're going to be comfortable when it's 10 degrees in the morning but when it's 42 degrees in the afternoon uh, it starts to warm up, they can, they can start uh, shedding some of those layers to a point where they're comfortable. If they just have one big uh, uh, coat on, uh, a polar rated coat, and that's, that's perfect for 10 degrees, but when it becomes 35 or 40 degrees, uh, it's, it's, too, it's too much insulation for those conditions. So layering is good. We can also provide temporary enclosures with heating devices. We would do some of this in the construction industry, depending on our operations. Uh, but one thing to be aware of if you're using an enclosure or if you're using these types of heaters, carbon monoxide is, 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 uh, should be on our radar. If we're using gas, propane, wood, any anything carbon-based, any carbon-based fuel, there's the potential for carbon monoxide hazards. So there, we need to have properly ventilated enclosures if we are using these types of, of heating devices. Also, you need carbon monoxide uh, detectors inside the work areas, inside the enclosures, just to make sure that uh, there's not a, a dangerous level of carbon monoxide uh, in the space. Last slide, and uh, I mentioned footwear uh, earlier. You don't want to wear anything like this. These are for show, they're not for work. And the, uh, a set of western style cowboy boots should never be uh, should never be seen in any workplace, unless it's a rodeo or a sale barn or something like that, because they are more for show than work. Now, what we have in the other pictures here are good uh, examples of winter work boots. Uh, this is this is the actually the boot that I wear. I don't wear the insulated version, but a the uh, a Danner work boot is very good. You can get insulation up to 800 grams of insulation, and you can get uninsulated as well. Now, in in the South, in Oklahoma, Texas, even in the coldest winter months you can probably get by without insulation as long as you have the proper socks that you're wearing with your boots. But if you're up north, if you're in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Minnesota, you might want to go with the uh, insulated 
variety of work boot that's available. Now, this is an example of a boot that is designed for the cold and the snow. Uh, these pictures here I want to highlight or just very briefly mention another concern if you have workers in cold conditions. If there's cold, there could be icy surfaces. Uh, the icy surfaces can result in some serious injuries. You have slips on the ice, worker hits their head, so the soles of our work boots need to be considered. Uh, probably the best solution for working on ice would be this type of device here, uh, Yak Tracks. I think Yak Tracks is actually a, a company name or a specific product name, but these types of devices, there may be other names than Yak Tracks, but these types of devices that fit on your shoes and they have metal studs uh, built in that's going to give you better traction on ice, it's well worth the investment. Uh, Usually when we bought them in, in, in Denver, I think they were 10 to 15 bucks that we would pay for them. And that brings us to the end of this unit. Uh, we only have three videos in this unit. You do have the study guide that's pretty lengthy. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, this will be, uh, it's not our last unit, but the next to the last unit. The next unit will be the last unit for the semester. And in that uh, unit, we will talk about ergonomics. Let me know if you have any questions.